Schumacher is a brand that in the US was more of a novelty for the most part for a little while, a brand that people bought when they wanted to be different from the norm. However, in the US with the rising popularity of turf and especially carpet tracks, Schumacher is starting to make more of a name for themselves and I feel like now that I have more RAM in my PC and more time in my schedule, it would be a good time to explain where this British brand came from. <laughs> Let's start with the really early days. Some of you guys who follow full-size F1 racing may remember the name Schumacher with the driver Michael Schumacher. Oh my God! Stand up! Stand up! Look who it is! The Daily Mail was wrong! Who drove for a little while from the 90s till 2012. Even though the RC company that would become Schumacher had nothing to do with Michael himself, the company's origins can be traced to F1 with their founder, Cecil Schumacher. I won't get too much into Cecil's personal life and where he came from, but what I can tell you is that he worked with it a lot in motorsports before he actually founded Schumacher RC. Initially he was working for Bohr Warner before he was recruited by Cosworth and then went into the racing business uh, with Cosworth uh, doing transmissions for racing cars and, and other projects to do with transmissions to develop the Hobbs transmission to work with at the time, the standard DFV Formula One engines being used, which in my opinion was the best sounding V8 of all time. Here's a sound clip. Lovely. Great. <laughs> really great. Anyway, he noticed some of his workmates running some RC cars on the helipad and being an engineer, he started to look for ways to improve the little things. And the first thing he developed? The ball differential. You know that thing that pretty much every two-wheel drive dirt buggy has used since RC racing really took off? Yeah, that dirt ball differential. He gave his sum to his son Robin and his friends to use at their local club and very soon they requested these ball discs be stocked at the club for people to buy. Pretty soon, Cecil was also getting orders overseas for the disc as well. In a short amount of time, he was actually making more money from his side job of RC than with his day job as an engineer at friggin Cosworth. So he ended up opening up Schumacher RC as a fully fledged business in 1981 in Northampton, England. Once Schumacher was founded, they soon began developing their own 12th scale Pangar for indoor use called the XL. It had an intentionally flexible chassis, making it very forgiving to drive, along with being slightly more durable. After this, in 1983, the C car was made for indoor carpet use and pioneered a few different features the 12 scale pan cars use even today. In the late 80s, off-road racing began to become more popular than on-road racing and as a result, Schumacher needed to get with the times as well. This was when their first RC off-road buggy was developed in 1986 called the Cat. Looking at the actual design of the Cat itself, notice that unlike other four-wheel drive buggies at the time which used chain, shaft, or even cable drive, the Cat used a belt. The idea Cecil was going for was to produce a cost-effective solution to the four-wheel drive problem. It was also the first of their off-road cars to run their ball disc, which worked even better off-road than they did on-road. Another thing that set the Cat apart from other model RC buggies from companies like Tamiya or even Associated and a few others, was that their tire designs weren't scale replicas of what you'd see on a full-size car. According to Cecil, in an interview he did a little while ago, he states that because of how small RC cars are compared to full-size cars, in order for the tires to really dig in and find grip in soft surfaces like soft farm dirt or grass, two surfaces that were very popular at the time, especially in the United Kingdom, they basically needed to be full spikes. Another interesting story about the Cat was this. Initially, the Cat was designed with a very short chassis that only pros like Andy Dobson and Masami Hirosaka could drive. Cecil, even though he wasn't a pro driver, still enjoyed driving, so he decided to make a longer version that was a whole centimeter longer than the standard car, lovely christened the Geriatric Special. 
The geriatric special would go on to be very popular among average racers compared to the shorter chassis cat, which Misami would take on to win the Ifmar 10 scale world back in 1987. Well, I'm very, very pleased, Tony, obviously. It's, uh, it's been a long, long battle. We started about two years ago, and the car has been in production for just about a year now. And uh, this is a, a most delightful result for us after a lot of w hard work. In fact, this year we've taken, I think, every uh, international e event that's been held. We won the European Championships back in Austria uh, two months ago, and, and now this, uh, I I'm really absolutely delighted. Uh, Masami Harasaka, he's an incredible driver. After this big win at the IFMAR Worlds, thanks to Masami, Schumacher was looking to expand into the world of two-wheel drive buggies as they were, to put it simply, a very logical step to take from a business perspective as they are becoming more and more popular. Off Schumacher went to design a new two-wheel drive car and he came back with this right here. This is a Topcat two-wheel drive buggy, and if you were to look at it with the body on, you'd be right to ask the question, wait a minute, where be the front shocks? Once you take the body off though, your question is answered. These are actually lay-down style chocks and somewhat upside down that work in the same way that MRO buggy I showed a little while ago worked. They did this for a few reasons including, but not limited to, protecting the shocks from damage and crashes, so they could reinvent the crash back system using their previous cat, and lastly, that I know of, it looked nice so they did it. This car would go on to win a few British national titles, two Euro titles in 1989 and 1990, and even an AMA finish in the 1989 IFMAR 10-scale Worlds, placing 6th place, I believe. Things were very much looking up for Schumacher. So much so that they continued to innovate with other cars like the Procat, the Cougar two-wheel drive buggy to replace the Topcat, and would go on to win uh, just a few titles here and there, both in off-road space and on-road, with their SST touring cars doing particularly well in the US winning 10 national championships from 1997 to 2006. However, racing isn't the only thing that Schumacher was doing at the time. This is going to be brief, and even though this channel isn't focused on bashing, it would be a bit short-sighted of me to not mention at least a little bit of their bashing history. A good example would be their Nitro 10 Touring Car Series, being one of the few RTR cars of its era. This kicked more into high gear when Cecil's son, Robin, took over the managing director position of the company in 2001, with cars and trucks like the Havoc, Wildcat, Menace, and Fusion. All of these cars with the exception of the Wildcat were nitro speed cars and trucks, all capable of speeds upwards of 60 miles an hour, which for a nitro car from the early 2000s is very impressive. Schumacher would continue to make bashers and kind of ride that wave throughout the 2000s while also supporting their on-road touring car program with the MI series. Oh, by the way, did I mention they have a twin-engine monster truck called the Manic? and the MI3 touring car holding the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest LAN RC at 161 miles an hour, or 260 kilometers an hour? Pretty good! <laughs> now, I would go more into detail about how their bashing program went, but over time, said program began to fade as brushless systems became more and more mainstream. Also, like I mentioned in a few of my other history videos, there's some stuff that I simply can't verify due to lack of information out there regarding a specific topics. Things like AE and Losi's on-road programs are good examples of this. Schumacher, even though they don't fully bury the info on their old basher models, there isn't much beyond a quick mention on their website. If you guys have any, any general info or experience or the stories you'd like to share about Schumacher bashers or Schumacher in general, feel free to let me know in the comments below. With that being said, let's do what Schumacher did back in 2008 and get back to racing. Later on, in 2008, Schumacher were going to reinvent their premier RC off-road racer after prototype and revision, the CAT, this time calling it the CAT SX. This was sort of a precursor to the modern CAT L1 we have now with its belt drive design, mostly due to the fact that at the time it was special for the fact that it was able to handle brushless systems. Later on, in 2010, they would return to the two-wheel drive world with the Cougar SV, one of the first mid-motor setups to come out of the box and be used extensively in the racing world the second being the 22 from TLR. 
To round out their lineup of comebacks came the Superstock and Eclipse 12-scale pan cars, a style and scale of car the Schumacher had made for about 30 years. During this time, they seemed to have shied away from bashing altogether, to focus entirely on racing. Makes me wonder if there's a parallel universe where Schumacher became a bashing brand. Anyway, once they got back into off-road racing and picked up Michael Orlowski, it was pretty much British National win, after EOS win, after Touring Car BRCA win, so on and so forth, you get the idea. These days, with the rise of high grip carpet and astroturf tracks in the States and around the world, Schumacher has very much done better around the world as well. And since these tracks only to continue to become more and more popular, due to reasons I will mention in a future video, chances are Schumacher is not only here to stay, but they're here to grow. That's all for now. I know I kind of skinned over a few things later on in the history, but trust me when I say it gets a little bit confusing in terms of timelines later on. Anyway, if you enjoyed this light history lesson, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. That's it for this video, but don't forget to subscribe and check out the rest of our RC Racing video series. And don't forget, be an RC TV hero. Make sure to hit that join button and find out all the details about being an RC TV hero.